Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup for uh, for inviting me to speak about uh, these uh, key challenges, some of the key challenges and facilitators in, uh, in e-learning in language teaching context. Um, I'm going to draw on my experience um, teaching blended distance and face-to-face -face web enhanced formats and, and also research and I'll uh, sort of cite a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, sort of points today from a study that was funded by the Ontario Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration um, that we did last year and I'll tell you more about that as we go through. But uh, just to give you an overview of uh, what I will be talking about, you know, as we all know, we're living in an increasingly technology mediated world. <coughs> so the way we communicate is changing quite a bit. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that to sort of ground the uh, presentation. And then I'm going to talk about this study uh, a group of us did in Toronto. And this is an ESL, was an ESL e-learning feasibility study funded by the Ontario government in community-based ESL programs. Um, and out of this stemmed a number of challenges that people were talking about. Part of the findings that we, we reported that any of you who have worked with technology in any language or learning context will appreciate because they're not that new. They're things that have been reinforced over the decades in computer-assisted language learning but are changing a little bit given the technology changes we have these days and uh, how we can really transform those challenges into facilitators and into factors that actually can enhance these, uh, the use of technology and when, when it's appropriate. And we'll talk about one of the key findings that arose in this research that was a call for this human feel in online environments because any of you taken fully online courses, um, you know, depending on the tools that were used, there tends to be a bit of attrition because this this sterility in the environment, this anonymous feeling that I'm not connected with people the way I would be in a face-to-face -face class. Certainly with language learners, that can be a big factor. So I'm going to highlight that uh, finding from this research and from my own teaching practice and then we'll have a look at one example of uh, we looked at a number of best practices across Canada and I'll highlight one example from Ontario in an ESL e-learning context that uh, that shows some of these facilitators that really can enhance language teaching and learning online and then we'll uh, take questions and uh, sort of talk more about these uh, these challenges so, uh, you know, as we're all aware, um, you know, our world is becoming increasingly technology mediated. And certainly the way we're communicating using text, um, chat, you know, Facebook, Skype, um, these things are increasing and really changing the way we're using language. And this, I like this chart, and I, I got this when I went to this distance teaching and learning conference. It's regularly in Madison, Wisconsin. And, uh, and the keynote speaker, Judy Brown, talked about the use of mobile technology in learning. And this wasn't language learning, this is just education in general. But she gave this chart which really sort of, uh, really sort of showed the significance of these dramatic changes that are happening. I mean, this is now two years out of date, but still you can see, you know, the smartphone use increasing, Facebook, like, multiplying by tenfold, Twitter being sort of off the radar in 2008, and now it's uh, tweeting is a regular practice among people, businesses, etc. And uh, tablets were really not on the radar then, and how they're really mainstream nowadays and becoming really often one's primary computing device that people use versus desktops and even laptops. And the number of apps you know, and the potential those have for education and language learning. So it just, uh, it sort of quantifies what we're seeing in our daily life a, a little. And, uh, you know, I found it quite, quite surprising. And she gave this talk on mobile technology and she said, you know, we U.S. Americans, because it was a U.S.-based conference, check our mo mobile devices approximately 150 times a day, on average 6.5 minutes. Now, I don't know. I'm alone with this. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe every seven minutes. But, uh, but you know, I mean, people always. I mean, I take the subway to York on a regular basis in Toronto, which is a long commute, and I always see people just glued to their mobile phones or tablets and doing a variety of different things. 
And so it's really this exponential impact that these technologies are having on the way we're using language. And, and that, I think, sometimes it, as language educators, I know I was sort of not really thinking that how, to, how I teach language should reflect these technology-mediated approaches also. So it's something to uh, certainly think about in that regard. You know, and, and as you probably sense, there's a lot of technology used daily in daily life, but in the language teaching classroom, sometimes technology isn't used um, in, uh, in ways that we use it sort of on a regular basis. And this has, you know, been, been a, a sort of recurring theme in computer assisted language learning for many years and still recurring now. I know in our experience at York, there are many language teachers. We teach many different languages in our Department of Languages, Literatures and Linguistics, many of whom really don't use much technology, if at all. You know, and that may not be a bad thing, depending on the potential, depending on the learners and the, and the ideal outcomes you want. So we'll talk about that, because it really, you know, we don't want to force technology use. It really needs to be leveraged appropriately, and we'll talk about that. And I'm going to really um, talk about this study that we did last year in 2013. And this, this was grounded in this landscape of technology media and language use. But also it was funded by the ministry, the Ontario Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration. And they were interested in seeing how technology can be used in community-based ESL programs to not just enhance learning, which is one of their sort of ideas that maybe this can individualize learning a little bit for multi-level classes that were uh, often quite big and quite varied in learner types. Um, but it can also reach students who were in rural areas, also students who had busy schedules and couldn't fit in a regular face-to-face -face class because sometimes some of these classes were 20 hours a week for newcomers. So these were often hard to schedule in. So they wanted to explore the potential of integrating technology into these environments in these community-based classes. And so the goal was really examining the feasibility, how feasible is that, and looking at the perspectives from instructors, from learners, and administrators. So I'll talk about this research as we go through, and you'll hear the voices of participants in this study that are really quite profound and really share unique perspectives on this uh, issue of technology integration. So the methodology that we used for this study was sort of three stages. We initially did a research report, and that was looking at what were current practices in technology media language learning uh, around the world in Canada, North America, in English language contexts like ESL, English second as a second or additional language. So defining those uh, sort of benefits and limitations, what the literature was saying, and then we also tried to find some practice sites that were using technology and they, um, you know, sites that really perceived it as being used effectively. So we, uh, we did that in the first stage and then we used that information in this research report to really inform this focus group stage. So we did 12 focus groups in four different locations in Ontario with different focus group with learners, different ones with instructors, with administrators, and ask some questions about what do you think, how would you use technology? Do you use it now? Um, how would you use it in the future? Is it relevant to your context, to these types of learners? And we got very interesting findings that I'll share with you as we go through. And then we use all that sort of, uh, all these findings to inform this province-wide survey that was then disseminated to uh, just under 300 participants. Well, we got responses from just under 300 participants at the end. And if you want to read a little bit, uh, we have sort of a summary of this research on the TESOL Ontario uh, website on the contact, um, their TESOL Ontario contact online journal in uh, 2014. So you can read about the uh, research fully and the findings in that article. So part of, part of this research really was defining what are the benefits, <laughs> first of all, of using technology in language learning environments. And so, you know, these won't surprise any of you. These have been around for many years. But this idea of flexibility, self-paced learning, and, and as language learners, you know, if I'm in a face-to-face -face class and an instructor says something, I may not really get that, or I may need to work with that a bit more than my, my neighbor my classmate beside me. So it allows this self-paced 
approach with language learning. Um, it also allows this individualized access. Um, and certainly if you have multi-level classes, this can be beneficial. And this multimodality. Um, so, you know, for different learner types, so I can see the language, I can hear it, I can read it, I can move, ar play around with it um, to varying degrees. So, those uh, certainly have been reported for many years in, in call research. Um, and this increase nowadays that we have with interactivity in, in online environments. You know, we can do video conference, we can do sort of uh, Google Plus Hangouts where you can interact I see people, listen to people, and have this interactivity. And that uh, is quite, quite interesting and certainly quite <coughs> has uh, strong potentials for language, uh, language learning. And, and these opportunities for extensive second language output. Um, so this is where, you know, because I, I used, a, I teach um, in the ESL credit program, credit courses we have at York that are in undergraduate. And a number of us are using, well, we use Moodle at York, so Moodle is our learning management system. But I've, uh, you know, for many years I've been enhancing my academic preparation classes with written discussion forums because students really want to expand their writing skills. They want to develop writing and reading skills. And it allows students to really have an extra venue that they may not share in class, it, they can write on a sort of bi-weekly basis online and then I see this writing as an instructor, I can see it, use it as a needs assessment and get a tr uh, sense of what some of the trends are in these areas. So it really gives students the, the chance to write and also not just for me, the teacher, but writing for their audience, for their peers who will see their writing in this space. So it is that extensive uh, opportunities for output and also, you know, an audience beyond the teacher that is quite motivating. Um, and this, uh, this increased sense of audience, uh, I did a project where we had students in Toronto um, use a wiki to write collaborative essays with students in Dubai. And we had students um, do their online profiles, first of all, because they hadn't, you know, they needed to meet each other. And the, we noticed as instructors the investment that students put into preparing a really poignant profile that, that represented the aspects that I wanted to convey was powerful. So that psychosocial aspect of this identity formation or negotiation online is, is quite exciting. And it really did you know, we had students really attending to grammar and attending to vocabulary, saying, I want this to really look good because this is, I'm portraying me in this environment. So it was interesting in that regard. Um, you know, and this idea of potentially enhanced engagement autonomy through these very tools, using learners' funds of knowledge. So having, you know, we have, can write, have students write narratives about their experience, share aspects of who they are in a different way than you'd be able to in a face-to-face -face class and other students to see those aspects. So this idea of tapping into multi-literacies pedagogy is also developing digital literacies that students see as very transferable in today's world because I've got to use these tools not just in language learning class but in my workplace and my social interactions with people so it adds a, a different transferable transferable dimension to the language learning environment. And, and one of the benefits certainly with using a learning management system are you have all these analytical tools. So you can see students' participation in different ways. Now there are pros and cons because some of the tools have different features, others have different features. But, you know, I use a, a discussion tool that was developed at OISE called Pepper um, that allows you to see students' contributions, you can see the time they've been online, which I don't really feel is relevant, but you can see the number of notes they've posted, the number of notes they've responded to. You can like notes in Pepper, so you see the number of likes they've had, the number of likes they, you know, so the likes they've placed, and the mean, and it has a statistical formula that shows the average mean of the whole group, those above and those below. So it gives a snapshot, I mean, it's, you know, far, you don't want to put too much weight on these analytical tools, certainly, but it does give some indication of what students are doing online. Whereas if you're working with a class of 25 students in a face-to-face -face environment, it's sometimes hard to keep tabs on where, 
what people are doing. Um, you know, and, one, and a number of instructors, when we did this study last year, said that I would like these online tools to organize my teaching. If I have an online space like a learning management system, I can organize my documents. I can or organize learner portfolios, student portfolios in this environment, um, as opposed to carrying around all these paper and, and books and binders, etc. Um, and certainly the ministries, you can appreciate, as many institutions, see these as potential benefits to make the learning more efficient and leverage classroom space. And this was certainly the, the issue in these, uh, these uh, community-based ESL programs that some of, the, some of the venues really had no classes, and so they had to turn away students. But if they had two blended classes, then two groups could use the same class and they could uh, leverage that classroom space more efficiently. And they could also increase enrollment by offering blended classes or hybrid classes that would uh, allow students more flexible scheduling. So there are those benefits. Um, some of the, we interviewed a number of sites and I'll, I'll give one, I'll sort of highlight one of those sites at the end um, that, uh, you know, really had these really, what they perceived as really effective ESL e-learning practices. And, uh, you know, they had really high satisfaction rates, many of these sites we, we spoke to, and they'd done surveys with their students who said, yeah, we love this because it gives us a little more individualized attention, more flexibility, and I can still interact with my fellow students, which was a big factor, and we'll come back to that when I talk about the human feel. Um, and there were instructors in a number of these sites that said, I really like this classroom environment because I get to know my students differently when they're contributing online because they go a bit deeper. They share aspects of their experience that I wouldn't normally hear in class. So it, it can add that interesting psychosocial dimension, not always, but you know, in some cases. Um, certainly there were some indications, some of the sites did do studies and found that they had increased uh, writing and uh, Speaking and listening, interestingly, not, no one found reading outcomes enhanced in blended environments or, or online environments versus face-to-face. -face. Um, and, uh, you know, there was this sense that instructors were saying, my students are, are becoming more autonomous in these environments. Um, and this aspect of digital literacy. And, and this one, you know, this one quote, um, you know, uh, this one is, these two instructors were from different institutions. This one in BC, the blended program gives learners a sense of ownership, gives them a safe, motivating environment. So there's this safety that if I'm in this self-paced environment, you know, we all know what it's like in language learning environments. You, we take risks to speak in class and to put ourselves out there. And sometimes in this, in this secure environment where I can edit my contribution or think about it or re-record it before I submit it, um, then I have this safety factor that can add um, to the uh, sort of uh, effective dimension. Um, and then this one site that was occupation-specific language teaching that I'll share at the end, this was, a, this was actually from a distance education program that Colleges Ontario developed for technology professionals, an ESL, ESP, English for a Specific Purpose course and they were turning a number of their courses, the college courses, into blended distance or web-enhanced programs. And these, this curriculum development team did three courses in a row, and they did this distance education course with uh, and technology professionals and really found that their, the learners loved this, this web, this complete distance program that was focused on teaching speaking and listening skills. And they were really, the curriculum development team was very, uh, concerned about how can we develop an a online fully distance program to develop speaking and listening skills when we needed to integrate soft skills and uh, body language and nonverbal communication into that. But they use a lot of video conferencing. They use a lot of um, sort of one-on-one -on -one meetings with the instructor. The instructor had online office hours. And granted, it was a very small class. It was only 10 students, which uh, I'm sure made somewhat of a difference, but learners love this delivery environment. Um, but, you know, that, that's the good side of it. Yeah, now, now we go into the longer challenge list. Um, you know, and these really, what we found, which I'm sure many of you can appreciate, is that the infrastructure in these environments wasn't there 
So there, there was limited technology infrastructure, limited access to technology, certainly in these ESL community-based sites. Um, digital literacy was an issue with some instructors um, and also some learners. Um, and the instructor population in this cohort that we examined tended to be more than half of them were over 50 years of, years of age. Um, so it was this, uh, this aspect that, and some of them were using online tools very effectively, but there was this concern about digital literacy that we need training to, to work with these tools. Um, and there was a, a lack of tech, technology and pedagogical support. How do we teach online? This is new to us as instructors, so how do we actually work with these aspects online? Um, and, and, you know, any of you who have taught online know it often takes a lot of work, quite a, quite a bit more time than it does in a face-to-face -face class uh, to set up new structures to troubleshoot techno technology issues. Um, you know, and this is often unpaid time if you're a sessional instructor, as, many, as all of these sort of individuals were. Um, so, you know, do you want to go there for that, uh, for that potential benefit? And there was this recognition that, you know, we interviewed learners and talked to learners equally in this research, that we need to learn how to learn online, how to learn languages online. Very few of the learners had had experience in online learning, or, and specifically in online language learning. So how do, how do we self, how do we motivate ourselves within these environments? So there was a recognition of that. And also the technology options for instructors these days, there's so many options, it can be completely overwhelming and you start looking for, you know, video conferencing tools or chat tools and you say, whoa, I'm just going to turn that off and go back in the class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it can be this overwhelming state. Um, you know, and a lot of these benefits that I cited earlier really do depend on design, they just depend on infrastructure, they depend on content and uh, pedagogy. Um, so it, you know, it's a big, it's often a big challenge to get to that point where we can make these environments effective. And one thing, you know, that's come up in the literature with online education and certainly language learning is this, this anonymity, this sterility in the environment that can really, it doesn't, we don't feel connected to each other as human beings. So this, need for building this classroom learning uh, sort of sense of community. Um, yeah, so, you know, out of, out of those challenges, if we turn them around and if we support some of these main areas, that's how we can really create facilitating factors for these areas. So I'm going to talk about three areas that uh, were key out of this research, um, technology, infrastructure, building curricula, for online and blended environments, teacher and learner support that includes training, online teaching, strategies, tech support, that was a huge area and a big barrier in, in making these, uh, making this move into technology integration and integration, integrating this human feel into, uh, into these environments. So I'll talk about these three areas. Um, and infrastructure was the key, certainly in these community-based ESL programs, but I know also in our programs at York and other institutions that I've worked at often, the infrastructure is, you know, is, is partly there, or you have to bring in other components to, to support it. So it often is quite a bit of work. And in these community-based ESL classes, we, you know, the majority of instructors and administrators said there was a lack of adequate technology. Some of the sites had computer labs, that were developed in the 90s, and some had computers from the 90s in these labs that were just gathering dust. Um, now, others had a lot, of, a lot of technology infrastructure. So again, the funding was very different in these sites. Um, so it really depended on the funding formula in these sites and how the, how the uh, you know, infrastructure had been set up. Um, but there was a certain comfort with some of the instructors with computer labs because we taught in that we'd had software to use. Some of them also taught link language instruction for newcomers. Um, classes that were, were requiring a certain amount of software or computer lab time for their students. 
Um, you know, and any, any of you who've used computer labs know that it can be disruptive because you have to change environments, you have to get everyone logged in. It can be a lot of logistical time spent on the technology access. Um, and, and, you know, the, and these instructors and administrators said we need curricula, we need online content, and we suggest that you don't reinvent it because there's stuff out there. There's Link Home Study, which is one of the programs across Canada that is, uh, has online content um, that could be used in, in these ESL community-based contexts. So this idea of pooling resources and, uh, you know, we interviewed a number of practice sites across the country that said everyone's developing their own content. Why can't we somehow share it? You know, now there is Tutela, you know, which is handy to sort of uh, pool resources to some degree. But I mean, if more of that can be done, it would leverage a lot of this work. Um, and using open educational resources, you know, the, the, there are many out there that could be used quite effectively. But it's a matter of getting them up and going. Um, and, and instructors and administrators really called for this need for interactive authorable content. They've been conditioned with using software programs that were very static, like textbooks. That well, I can use that bit, but this really isn't relevant for my teaching context. So I really want to adapt it. Um, so this concern that I want to really localize this information in this environment and, and really use uh, learner portfolios, uh, you know, to have a documentation. I mean, this is movement probably from the European sort of uh, framework uh, of using portfolios to document progress and re recognizing there's a potential for e-portfolios uh, uh, that could be used online. But this need for user friendliness was certainly key. Um, training and support was a big area that was brought up. We had some sites saying we have one, you know, we have one tech person who manages 40 sites. And so we won't see that person for another week by the time they get here. So we're just going to switch to classroom work for now. So this tech support, and they, you know, there was this call for not just technology support, but pedagogical technology support. This need for online language teaching support also, uh, which is a bit of a different beast, you know. Um, you know, and, and uh, we had these concerns expressed by some of the some of the instructors saying, you know, I'm concerned about going into a class where the students know more than me about this technology, and I'm it's it's a bit of a barrier for me to go into that environment and feel. Um, you know, like I don't know, know, know enough or know as much as they do. And then we had learners saying, you know, there were similar age groups. I mean, we had a range of age groups with this learner population who, who said we've got people who are complete techies and people who are just really don't know anything. And the keyboard being in English letters is not the character-based language that I come from. So there were those logistical issues also. Um, training and support. So what, what instructors were really saying, we want to also know the whys of why we should be using technology, not just how that we often get in workshops. We want to know what is the pedagogical uh, sense behind this or what are the pedagogical benefits behind this. And, you know, there was this call among instructors to see examples. Show us some examples of what can be done. Because, you know, if I have never learned online, or have taught minimally online, how, how can I really vision what I can potentially do in this environment until I see it? So this idea of hands-on online sort of learning experience was brought to the fore in this regard. And a lot of instructors, you know, cited these one-shot workshops where, where we have a smart board training for, for a half a day. And then, you know, a number of people talked about the smart board graveyard where the smart boards are used as whiteboards. It's very expensive whiteboards in the corner because we had that training four months ago. Yeah, I sort of remember it, but, but I don't have the time, so I'm just going to use it as a whiteboard. So there was this real call for this job embedded, compensated, ongoing, this, this bit of a mentorship model of professional development for instructors, um, where I work along someone who's also doing it, and we troubleshoot together, and we can sort of give each other ideas. And, you know, we, we found in many of the sites that uh, instructors, some instructors were 
the typical early adopter, that I'm going to use Web Enhance methods, even though it's used, costing me more of my personal time, and I'm going to try using wikis or a blog with my class. Um, and there were a couple of sites that were having those, those instructors share their practices at staff meetings, at monthly staff meetings with the other instructors. So this idea of a continual contribution system where we share our practices with each other over time. And this PD partner model was developed by the Toronto Catholic District School Board that was the, also the coordinator, the coordinating body of this research. Um, just not about e-learning training, but just with professional development a mentoring model where, where experienced teachers worked with, uh, with uh, peers and really shared their practices and had sort of gave, uh, gave feedback on, a, on an ongoing basis with other, with other uh, teaching partners. And, and really this concern about it's going to take me a lot of time and I need to get paid for this or it needs to be compensated somehow. So these are the structures that can sometimes really be a barrier. And learners also, to, you know, sort of express similarly that I, I want some online language learning training. I want to be able to train to figure out how I learn this way because I've been norm I've been used to seeing in a class with instructors. And one site that we uh, interviewed um, in BC was having a self-paced learning. They did a little video-based training session for learners. And what they did is they matched, because they had weekly intake, so they had new students come in every Monday. And what they did was they had um, this peer mentoring model where um, a, uh, an individual who is willing and experienced in this online learning environment would sort of support this new student coming into the class um, through this mentoring model that was quite, quite, um, seemed quite successful. And also gave that sense of classroom community a bit of a kickstart in that way. Um, so those certainly seem to, seem to help in this area. And, and uh, this, you know, this uh, administrators and instructors really felt tech support was inadequate and there was a need for not just to set up an e-learning system, but to maintain it and update it. And this is one of the challenges that was found with Link Home Study, um, that the, you need, you know, this, the, the uh, program had been developed in many years ago when software developers needed to make any changes, so teachers couldn't make the changes. So some of the material seemed out of date. So there was that, that recognition that we need to put in our budgets the ability to update these materials and these pedagogical approaches. And then the, the final factor that I'll talk about here really is this interesting, um, interesting phenomenon. And we had a learner, you know, who, uh, who was, you know, was texting in the focus group on, on his cell phone and he said, you know, I really want, we said, you know, what, 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 what do you think would help in these online learning environments if you use technology? He said, the human feel. So he said, wow. And, and uh, this colleague of mine looked at it. I said, wow, what a great quote. <laughs> you know, and he said, we need to keep, he said, we need to keep the human feel in this class. The teacher is very important in motivating me and helping me learn. And the, these, the learners also said that I also want that time with other learners, recognizing that it, that this, uh, this group of participants were ESL um, newcomers coming to Canada. So they said that the ESL class was often the first environment to meet people outside of their home environment, outside of their language environment. And it was a real desire to connect with people. So we wanted that socialization. We wanted that, you know, that additional learning that happens at break, the networking that happens. Um, you know, and Nina Garrett, who did a sort of summary of call in 2009, said, you know, simply providing students with web links to authentic materials is not of a self-constituted effective call. The real challenge is developing activities that will integrate authentic materials and engage students. And that, you know, I've experienced online environments where the textbook has just been moved online and it feels static. It feels sterile in those environments. So there was this real recognition for this social interaction online. You know, and this is from the TESOL uh, technology standards. Deborah Healy and her colleagues talked about the importance in the teacher's role in creating this social presence in this online learning environment. And, you know, this 
this uh, sort of summer discussion of blended learning um, by Hong and Samimi talks about uh, the importance of the teacher's role in these, in these blended learning environments is vital to create this, to set expectations about how we communicate, how we participate, to reinforce um, effective uh, participation, etc., and really model stuff, but really be a key in achieving, uh, setting that tone for that effective environment. Um, you know, and some of you may be familiar with this. I mean, it's a bit dated now, time-wise, this model, a community of inquiry model, but it's been used for years to talk about sort of this creating this social presence in online environments. And, you know, it talks about the key role of the teaching presence, facilitating this cognitive presence, how we, how we share, we create a community of inquiry with each other, we build knowledge together, we pool resources, and also how we create this social presence, how I express my identity and myself in this online environment. Um, and it, it's, you know, it's still being cited quite widely and it's, you know, it's a pretty straightforward model that also can be applied, can be applied to a face-to-face -face classroom environment, certainly. But it is this idea of these three aspects really working together to create this, uh, this social interactive environment of engagement. Um, you know, and this, the, the research that we did, really, we asked uh, participants, learners, administrators, instructors, what type of um, learning environment do you see as being most effective? And the vast majority said we, we would prefer a blended or a hybrid learning environment. We want the face-to-face -face time. We will also want to leverage the best of the online tools so we can individualize learning, so we can work at our own pace. So I, as an instructor, can assess students' learning because I have a little more time to see what they're doing in these online spaces, and I can give individualized feedback. And you know, a blended learning, as uh, I'm sure many of you are aware, you know, has been talked about as the best of both worlds: the self-paced and face-to-face, -face spontaneous environments that we need in language teaching for the spontaneous, the spontaneous nature of communication that we need to uh, reinforce and, and practice. Stephen Thorne talks about blended learning, you know, as one of the most important educational advances. Um, you know, and we had this one instructor and she had, had done the Learn IT to Teach program for Link instructors, which is online English language teacher education. Um, and she was blending all her community-based ESL classes. And she said, I've had learners who really don't want to leave. They love this community. They love this group because we share stories online because I have the space to create, write narratives about myself that I wouldn't share in the face-to-face -face class. So it can potentially deepen these connections. Um, and blended learning comments that instructors said, you know, one instructor said learners in different levels in the same class could work on different contexts. And this was a big benefit, perceived benefit in these often multi-level community-based ESL classes where you had, you know, sort of beginner, intermediate, and advanced learners in the same group. Um, you know, one administrator saying, citing this, uh, one of these instructors who was using blended learner, the students are all there on the computers busy, they just keep going because they're so engaged in what they're doing. So that's a clear, obvious benefit of e-learning, they're sticking around. And some of these community-based programs are contingent on enrollment. You know, so that's one of the structures that plays into this. Because if you don't have students, your funding di disappears. So, so engaging students in, in the language learning process was certainly key in that regard. Um, we had learners saying that, yeah, I like these environments. We had some learners saying, you know, I come in class and the teacher is teaching to this group, this level of learner, but it's not me. And my time is really precious. And because I've got a family to support, I've got to look for a job, and I've got these other responsibilities, so I want to really leverage my time really effectively. So we had learners saying that the potential that e-learning could allow me to prepare myself and do individualized work on my own, and then use that in class. Um, some of the strategies that were shared in this, in this research, really, um, that were adding this human feel were certainly video, Welcomes, instructors, there were a number of instructors who did weekly video welcomes, um, saying hello to the students, even though they saw them in the face-to-face -face class. But it would give them that 
social presence online. This is what we're going to do today. It gives you also a chance to talk about stuff, um, set expectations on communication strategies in this online environment that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. It would take too long to write, etc. cetera. Um, peer mentors that I've talked about, you know, for sort of online learning and these environments certainly helps. And, and narratives, um, students sharing stories and really tapping into the linguistic and cultural capital of learners in these environments can really be quite beneficial. Um, you know, some environments, um, you know, discussion forums use image icons. So when we're talking to each other, we're writing, we can at least see who that is or the image that it represents. You know, we had instructors do introduction activities where students chose, chose a picture that represented me, something about me, and they shared what that showed about me. That was an interesting way to sort of introduce each other. Um, we had also individuals do, uh, instructors do collaborative activities in small groups online, and then debriefing those findings in the face-to-face -face class um, that was quite beneficial. And really, what came up in the literature and in a number of these sort of online blended environments was the importance of synchronous communication to create connection with people. That asynchronous is convenient, because I can you know, respond when I want to. But if I'm same time with you, I feel I'm there with you, you know, which is not, not a surprise. Um, this individualized feedback, there were a number of instructors saying these blended environments give me more time to assess what students are doing so I can see students that need support in these areas and I can give them the, that individualized feedback because I'm listening to the videos, I'm listening to their audio recordings, I'm seeing their writing, I can assess their spoken communication skills, their written communication skills and give them more feedback than I would have the chance in a face-to-face -face class. But, you know, these environments we found really need these um, explicit expectations. Um, and these and online accountability because often these we don't know what to do in these environments if we're the first time in here if I have to write a post and you don't tell me how long the post should be I may write a three-page post that uh, everyone is really bored with and takes me forever to write you know so you know and these out of course cafe sort of environments for for informal learning so I'll just close this talk by giving an example. And this was, as I told you earlier, this is an example from this occupation-specific language teaching curriculum design team. And they were called, called on by on Colleges Ontario to design three uh, blended or online programs uh, very quickly within a two-year time frame. So they had to develop these. Some of these programs, uh, they started with a blended business program. This is for business professionals who go to college and need additional English language uh, skill development. Um, they had a blended business program that was delivered face-to-face -face, um, in English, but what they did is they transferred that online. And what they did, what the curriculum, di curriculum design team did was they looked at the curricula and said these bits could go nicely online and just pulled them out of the face-to-face -face curricula and then made those parts go online. So it was almost as though the online bit was homework type activities. The student did on their own and was very isolated from the class. I mean, they bring the knowledge back into the class, but it was done as self-paced additional sort of activities online. So that was the first one. This was the second one. Um, and this was a blended ESL um, curriculum for interprofessional healthcare. Workers. So this was for sociologists, for psychologists, for nurse practitioners. This was a range of, of individuals from a range of backgrounds in healthcare, broadly, broadly focused. And this was developed their English language skills. So this was a new curriculum that they had to develop from scratch for blended delivery. So I'll talk about this one in a moment. And the, uh, the third one, as I mentioned earlier, was this distance learning for technology professionals. And that was where some of these learners thought this is the greatest ESL course ever because um, I'm video conferencing with my friends, with the other classmates. I'm, I'm able to access the teacher, speak to the teacher one-on-one -on -one for half an hour, 20 minutes at a time when we video conference with each other because the teacher had you know, Google Plus Hangout hours, office hours. Um, and this, so 
the third one was a real success. This was also a big success. So it was interesting, and I'll, I'll share share with you what the uh, what the instructor did. These are big courses. These are 140 hour language training programs that are done in one semester. So they're really intense. Um, and this was, uh, it was specifically, as I mentioned, designed for blended delivery. So they'd already gone through the blended business course and the, the feedback from the blended business course, the first course they developed, was a bit flat. Students said, yeah, the online activities were okay, but I, but I really prefer the face-to-face -face class. Because again, this was online homework activities, self-paced activities that they would do. Um, whereas this one, they looked at the online, at the learning outcomes, that what do students really want? What do we want them to uh, be able to learn? And then what are the best tools and what is the best environment for them to learn this in? And they'd leverage the environment and the tools to t target those outcomes. So it was really designed that way, which the curriculum design lead that, uh, that we interviewed said that made a difference with really seeing, matching the outcomes to the environment and the tools. Um, you know, and they ended up doing a third online and two thirds face to face. They use Moodle because the a number of the colleges in Ontario use Moodle, so it was this Moodle based platform that they used. And uh, they uh, they what they did is they had students work online in variety of formats in grouping activities. They did use VoiceThread, which is an interactive presentation tool for any of you who haven't heard of it. Um, they used a range of different tools that were interactive online that had them interact with each other and they'd leverage, they'd bring those, bring that learning back into the class and build on it in the face-to-face -face class and then extend it back out into the online space. So it was this continual threading of the online space with the face-to-face -face space that was really um, part, of this, part of this program. As, as I mentioned before, the instructor did welcome videos, weekly videos, and she also, this instructor had no online teaching experience before she piloted this course. She never learned online. All the instructors actually in these three courses had never, uh, never learned, had experience teaching or learning online. So it was interesting to get their perspectives. But she did a welcome video each week that students really liked. She outlined explicit expectations about what you should be doing that was time consuming, certainly, to set up, but you should be only posting this amount, this length of a note each week, no more than two paragraphs, one screenshot, uh, this type of stuff, or you know, a three, no more than a three minute audio recording, etc. So it was very explicit about the instructions that students liked, so there was no ambiguity. Um, she used a lot of these multimodal activities, though, so they use VoiceThread to post and comment. They did their introductions using VoiceThread, so they do, um, this is about me, this is about, you know, and the instructor said, tell something about yourself as a person and something about your professional background, and they'd interact, they'd uh, create that in a VoiceThread presentation, so a slideshow where students can, you know, sort of post comments, audio comments, or uh, written comments within the presentation. Um, they use Vocaroo, which is a free web-based audio recording tool, which is pretty basic, just to practice voicemail messages. Because as healthcare workers, voicemail is, you know, a big part of all our worlds, but as healthcare workers, we have to learn how to do voicemail. So we, uh, we, they said, well, the online space is the best environment for that. So we'll use Vocaroo to have them record. And what they did is they recorded the message, um, and then students recorded the next one and listen to each other. So it was very interactive and they copied the instructor uh, by email. The instructor didn't have to listen to it, but what she did is she could selectively listen and sort of see over the, over the term and see um, sort of issues of pronunciation or, or work that they needed to do. And they, you know, used healthcare videos online where they'd have small group discussion forums and they talk about that in a small group then bring out bring back their findings into the face-to-face -face class so it was this uh, can sort of uh, this synergistic connection between the online space and the face-to-face -face space learners in the pilot of this uh, they like this blended delivery because they felt it maximized their learning time again this is again people are really stressed for time like many of us 
really want our time used efficiently in these learning environments and allows them to develop individualized healthcare specific language skills. And the learner said they got more one-on-one -on -one feedback in these, in these blended environments because the instructor was able to hear different types of output in these online environments. Um, and there was a real sense of community in this environment as I've talked about in some others. And this was an instructor, a very seasoned instructor, a very experienced instructor, no online experience. And she said she felt bonded more, she bonded more deeply with their learners in this environment because she heard their stories and their voice thread interactions that show pictures of themselves, different aspects than she would get to uh, sort of uh, get to know in the face-to-face -face environment. So this is one of, the, uh, one of the quotes we had from the study. The one instructor saying, e-learning has the potential, and that's certainly a big key word that should be in capital letters because it doesn't always happen, but the potential to change the texture of the classrooms by moving away from old stand-up and teach models to a more engaged model where learners become masters of their own destinies. So quite idealistic, but big. hopefully, yeah, big, big goals and big dreams, but hopefully, uh, yeah, so hopefully whets your appetite. So I, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Uh, just, uh, you need to, if you want to ask questions, we have all microphones, some uh, here. We need to turn that on. No, they will be on if you press on them. They they have to become green. Perhaps some don't work. So well, thank you very much. Perhaps we'll uh, we'll say thank you and then. Uh, yeah, do you wanna? I'm an OISE student, and I know Pepper. One of my questions was for these e-learning classes about how many students were in them for the OSLT or things. The OSLT, yeah, that's a good question, because that, I think, had a benefit of making a strong community of 15, maximum 15 students, which is, you know, as, as instructors, ideal. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it's one thing that's come up in the literature, too, that, uh, you know, blended learning is keeping track of a lot of stuff. So if you have a lot of students, it's harder then to attend to an individual progress. So yeah, 15 was uh, was the cap on the these college classes. Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. I have two questions. One of the things that, you know, everybody talks about community and language teaching is thinking of our student needs. <laughs> <Recap. laughs> And um, so, you know, looking at this, I know link programs. I've worked in them. I know a lot of people who work in them. That's a very different environment. And the people, health workers, these are people working full time who have don't have. Now, we do get some of those in our classes, but not enough. Like, you, you teach at York, so you, you have English academic language classes, right? right? Yeah. So I have a class of 30 students in a speaking class. I mean, I'm interested in a lot of these things. But I would dare to say I have pretty extensive feedback to my students on known for it. In that class, they do logs every week, 30 people, and I respond. So they do it in class. I don't see how them doing it at home it would be nice because our labs don't always work. Um, I'm just thinking about how much more feedback, like if somebody said to me they need even more one-on-one -on -one feedback, I would have to quit my job. And I'm not, I'm not, like, that's true. And my writing classes, the narrative idea is nice. I remember in the good old days, we had journals that we exchanged with other classes. But a lot of them do Facebook. One of my groups, I don't ask a lot of things. What I'm saying is who our students are. Right. They wanted a Facebook group. So four or five people in the grammar class did that. The rest of them said, I don't come here for Facebook. I want to know how to write essays. I don't want to know how to talk to you about I don't care. So, you know, so we respond. Every week they get an essay, the next week they get it back, you know, and that's the way. It's not this hand it back in the semester. So I'm wondering if they write it online, whether, I know the idea of the wikis and things, but how would they attend more to grammar? I suppose they could write it for each other and, and pass them around, which a lot of them don't like. So and I'm just saying, a lot of things you've said seem very appropriate for that context, but I, 
Yeah, no, you, you make a good point, and I think that's a key, uh, you know, a key factor that we really have to guide our use of technology and our, our classroom learning environments to our learners and their goals and their and their where they want to go. Because you know, we did interview some instructors in the in the study that said, you know, our learners don't want online approaches. That they're 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 sort of not not sort of uh, they're not really relevant for our needs. I mean, there are, uh, and I agree, I mean, you can do a lot of things in the class that can give, give amazing feedback. We're using technology. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, web-enhanced approaches, exactly. I mean, one, one benefit that technology can do is it can link students with other students as opposed to student with teacher. Uh, or, you know, now that has to be supported by the instructor um, to be able to, you know, give peer feedback adequately and uh, to use that learning. But it really, you know, that is one potential area that it really can, can help. And it can expose students, you know, in this environment, we had students with very different backgrounds in English, different language backgrounds. And it was one of the benefits in my teaching practice that I've heard is that it's useful for me to hear just not Jeff's voice, but other students' voice and respond to that accent or that sound of English versus mine. But we certainly do that in our classes, yeah. this group work, right? And yeah. the students, that's what they don't want to leave the class. Right. They're having such a great time talking to each other. Yeah. Not writing, <laughs> talking. Yeah. Um, yeah. My other question has to do with the same. I'm sorry, now I'll be quiet. These, the thing about these students, this is what our ESL students have that same need. They do not hear English. Many of them hear a bit in their lectures, right. and then they hear them in. in this is the one time when they have an input that's real, when there's someone actually responding to them. You know, they talk about not having to take risks online, the synchronous with you. It's like we're just, and that's we give them. I, I know with reading, I'm, I'm not convinced of the you know, improved reading because studies don't necessarily show that. But it's one, you know, so they can get lots of things online. They can watch TV. They can get lectures. They can have podcasts. The question is always will they be motivated? In English, at least, I don't know about other languages, but I know that for English, it's crucial for them to be because they're not getting it. Yeah, no, uh, and and motivation is it's a huge factor, yeah. you know, and uh, I mean that's where really seeing where learners are at and what uh, what really mm -hmm. what type of environment, what type of tools are are going to work. Yeah, for I, that mean, group. I haven't tried all of them. But I'm just saying those are the things that I think of. You know, yeah. like leveraging classroom space, we save money. You know, yeah, and I know right. that's not what you're talking about. Right. And I know that's not what we want, but there may be people who do want that. Well, yeah, and that was certainly part of the uh, part of the uh, sort of rationale for funding these studies. And and some of the administrators did say that you know I'm really in tight with space, and there are learners that I can't get to. So you know, in that context, uh, certainly learners from a rural environment or ones who really are. Uh, press for time, you know. Yeah, and then no, I see that distance learning. Okay. Yeah, thank you. No good, great questions. There was a question here. Yes. yes thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for the presentation. Uh, this question may not be fair to you, for you, but I mean, or to you, but still asking it, I'm a bit curious. How much of this, how much time is actually spent today as we speak in our faculties of education where they actually teach? Uh, second language teaching, and I know Stephanie can maybe maybe give us some insight with what's happening within our own university. But I mean, uh, obviously we are into a new world now, and uh, this is you know this is the thing. I mean, we, we will not be able to avoid this, uh, knowing how students operate today. Uh, but are we actually are we actually practicing what we preach in our own institutions where we're teaching, where we're training? Yeah, so you mean preparing to, new, yeah. preparing teachers yeah. for yeah. for using these types exactly. of tools in these environments. Yeah. Well, I can only speak. I, I'm I can speak from a TESOL uh, background, like teaching teaching English, just because of other languages, teacher teacher education context that I tend to work in mostly. But uh, I know that in many TESOL programs that I've been connected with. There is maybe a little bit of web-enhanced uh, approaches to education, but not not much at all. Um, and I know, I, I yeah, I mean, it's very, very, uh, very 
It's rare to find a program yet that I see. I know TESOL in the U.S. has an online certificate program in, in online ESL, teacher, ESL, EAL teacher education. But, uh, you know, other than that, I mean, it's uh, usually a one-day workshop or one module, perhaps, mm -hmm. in a long, uh, a long certificate program that I'm familiar with. I know, I think in the Bachelor of Education programs, it probably is a different approach. But I know in language teacher education in English that I've been connected with, that there often isn't much yet on this. And there is this need. I mean, they have, TESOL Ontario has these post-TESOL uh, post certificate programs. And one that's very popular is online sort of English language teaching. And would that be a blended course? That I think it is. I think it is blended, and part of it is on fully online. And Learn IT to Teach sort of arose from this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a you know some multi-level, very very challenging, very time-consuming program. But uh, you know students, uh, teachers in this program, some find some drop out because they just don't have the time. But it is one of the one of the options that's there for English language teachers. Yeah. Can I just uh, yeah. You know, just to add to this, because I do represent a TESOL program, a TESOL being program at college, and, you know, as other TESOL programs uh, mandated by TESOL Ontario, we have embraced this this need to educate, you know, teacher candidates in, in this area. So there's a whole course that's devoted to this, to teaching in, uh, you know, using web conferencing tools, uh, teaching using, you know, augmented environments or, you know, the 3D teaching environments. Uh, so there is... You know, and, and I think lots of TESOL programs, TESOL training programs in Ontario are on board with this, and they're adding courses. So I think things are happening. Yeah. And Stephanie, I, I, I'd like to hear from you on this. <laughs> um, I would say, based on what I know, I mean, I can speak from my own experience in my own class, but also what I generally know. I know that a standard core class that all of the students in the Faculty of Education take is now turned into a hybrid course. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't done an analysis to if it's, you describe those two different types, I don't know where it falls in that continuum, but I know one of the, um, the impetus for doing that was to get them used to the different tools, so from a tool training and hands-on. Um, personally, I feel that it's, and in my course I do this, as important to show them possible tools as it is to talk about pedagogy, backwards planning towards technology, but I think equally this idea that and you've alluded to this in the data that teaching with technology is not doing what you do face to face in an online environment, but equally more so that, I mean, your data talked about, and I was going to ask this, this idea of the best of both worlds. Do you agree with that, or do you, what do you find? And I say that just because I think that we're talking about this as compensating one for the other in this huge movement. And I think teaching with technology requires a readjustment that you end up teaching in a different way, and I think it's an exciting one, but I don't think there needs to be this sense of loss right. and going in that direction as much as there might be in it. I don't know yeah, no, it's Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. we can talk more. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great uh, question. Yeah, because it, it is only the best, I mean, depending on how you use it, and depending on the context of your learners and your environment that you're working in, you know? But I, but I really do think it can add different dimensions to the teaching and learning environment for learners, depending on you know what their goals are, it can also add interactivity from a language learning perspective um, that we wouldn't get. Well, we could get in a face-to-face -face environment, but it can just be on a more regular basis. Can I, can I yeah. add something just to respond to? I can't remember the name. Mar Mar Marlene, yeah. this idea of authenticity, I think, really factors in largely because that authentic communication environment is changing. So what we think as teachers is an authentic communication context is in fact might not align with what our students are thinking or the context in which they communicate. So trying to, that's the kind of stuff that I, I feel strongly should happen at the teacher training level to talk about that as opposed to simply focusing on here's a technology you could use in the next Yeah, like the so on. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like here's a couple of things, wise. okay, go. Especially yeah. seeing the limitations as you highlighted in infrastructure. I mean. If you give them all these tools and then they go into the classroom and, yeah. hey, P.S., there's one iPad for the school, I mean, it's very hard. Yeah. If I yeah. can just respond, I have a question for all these young people here. I have 20-something in my family. And 
authentic. They use tools. But I can tell you that those particular kids, and I'll just be who they are, don't find it more authentic. Yes, they like using Skype for certain things. They don't, I'm not sure they would agree that it's more authentic for them to you know, do this than to talk to somebody. But there's tools where you can talk. They have to do it in their seminars. Yeah, you, there are yeah. tools to talk, but why would you do that when you could do it face to face with a real person? Well, I think this is my point. That's, that's why I was asking the question yeah. is, is whether that it's not meant to replace something that's irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. I think it's or meant to. Will they really use it more often? Like they're not going to talk to the people from their English class. I'm just. I raise these questions just because yeah, my daughter teaches Spanish in the states and did that. And then students, the best student, said to her, "Oh, they cooperated. They did it." They said, "You know what? I don't know why we can just meet in class." And the other students didn't. They were I'm just saying one example. That's not a study. No, no, but it's you know, true. These are all issues we have to solve before we start saying this is the answer. But I think, uh, I think just to build on these points, I think one of the, you know, hopefully you saw in the data that students in this uh, in this study were really saying mm -hmm. we don't want everything online. We want face-to-face -face opportunities. Yeah, so we yeah. want that interpersonal interaction, and it was very important for them. And these were, again, very young 20, 20 or 21 year old students who were digitally literate, they were texting during the focus group, a number of them, jumping up and saying that we want a teacher, we want that interpersonal connection, we also want to meet, because meeting gives me other learning benefits with each other. It's not just the language that I'm learning in these environments, I'm also developing interpersonal connections and these human connections that are important to this experience. So yeah, I mean, you can't replace that, given our current technologies at all. So you've got to really try to leverage the different tools that are best for the learners and the environment. And they may be completely face-to-face, -face, you know? And then that's, that is really the goal, yes. Um, from a generational standpoint, um, our perspective, or at least in the few we see it as an extension of what you guys do in the classroom, not so it's complementary. It, it, it goes where we cannot go. So, for example, distance learning, sure. If there's rural schools that don't have access to sharing resources, fantastic. This is the kind of uh, way that we see the same thing as uh, Facebook or online profiles, Twitter, all these things. Um, the, the way I use Facebook, for example, is to chat with friends in Chile. Can I applaud to Chile every day? No, I can't. But I, I have this extension of, of myself, my virtual self. Um, so at no point will it replace your teaching, at no point will it replace one-on-one -on -one interaction. In fact, I think at least at U of T and my undergrad, all of us were saying, look, we don't want full online programs. I, I will not sit at home on my computer another five, ten hours or whatever it is and do an online course. I'd rather get on the bus, three-hour commute, go see the prompt and get that interaction, as you said. So uh, it's, again, an extension of a replacement. It's complementary. Continuously updating. Mm -hmm. uh, but my question was actually more towards um, the initial report, the research report. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if uh, Dan touched upon anything to do with games uh, theory. And because, for example, nowadays uh, for athletes, they have tons of web apps that can track your performance, that can give you badges, that can, uh, in a sense, make it a game so that you more encourage your more money. I was wondering if they had looked at that approach. Yeah, we did. We touched on it in the research report, and it's a you know it's coming up in the computer. This is language learning conferences that I've been to recently. It's an area that's really burgeoning. It's really blowing up uh, because there were a bunch of uh, I went to the Calico conference um, in May in Ohio, and there were a couple of really very interesting presentations on gaming and gamification. You know, in in language learning, and how it creates this this uh, this competition, but this excitement, this hype, and this uh, you know, I can I can track myself. That's yeah. So that is really <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think it, it's it's something that I haven't seen. You know, it's a whole other layer of uh, technology experience, but it's something that many people do in their personal lives. There are some apps, but there aren't, I mean, this is where a huge niche, I don't know, anyone wants uh, ideas for sort of career opportunities, I mean. <laughs> <laughs>
there's language like learning apps are really needed. Yeah. Because I mean, this is where you could really have some really focused um, aspect of learning and really use it in a very individualized way. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it seems to be, in my experience, I and mean, this is only from my lens, but it seems to be something that's really starting to really, uh, really just sort of run at a roll out. You know. Yeah. So it's me again. I'm a MD student at Boise right now, and one of the things I feel, and this is responding to artists' comments, and, but one of the things I feel in my classes, even when they have an online component, they don't teach to teach the online component. Mm -hmm. They go, this is something you could use in your classroom, we're going to show an example now. Yeah. So there's never, uh, sorry, there's never the, the side of how to use this in the classroom, they just show how I'm, so you have the student approach, you never the teacher approach. Like you know, sort of analyzing pedagogy behind it or the potential. Yeah, not even that really. It's like, okay, we're going to use a web form for this class, and then it's never touched on again, and they don't teach us how to properly facilitate web form. But I was wondering, because you did mention the peer metric mm -hmm. um, within schools and within the senior staff, I guess, in the school, I was wondering if you noticed there was a, a switch of focus or anything within those, and I'm not sure if that was a good or a question at all. But to have the mentors present the material not just as a presentation, but how to use this problem with the emphasis on problem. So not just or how how why you use it, but how can you use what do you, some of the outcomes and some of them. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we only touched on that again in this study because again it was a pretty comprehensive feasibility study, so we looked at a lot of areas. But it did come up in this uh, in this aspect of peer mentoring. Um, that, uh, that it allows me the chance, and this continual contribution that I alluded to, this was uh, an institution in BC that was doing this um, explicitly, and they said, and they called it con continual contribution system for, for employees, for instructors. So they required the instructors to share, and not just online practices, but face-to-face -face practices in a PD development um, component of each staff meeting. And what they would do is they would talk about, this is what I did, this is why I did it, this, these are some of the things that happened, and these are some of my questions um, that they would then sort of, uh, you know, present for their colleagues. And, you know, I think that may be an exciting model to work with because it's pretty, you know, it's what we tend to do when we interact with our peers on a regular basis anyway, just formalizing it a little bit. But really... You know, it's a chance for learning on all sides. That talking about this, I had these challenges with this. What, what do you think I could do with this? And there were some more formal PD mentoring models where instructors would have guest peers in their online environments, and they would observe, have a time observing what the other instructor was doing, and then have meetings and talk about well, it's troubleshoot and discuss what, what worked and what didn't and what could be improved, etc. Yeah. yeah, but it is, a, it is an interesting potential. Thank you very much. Yes, I